Let's talk Clippers Mavs because this was a phenomenal, phenomenal game. It was a 31 point game in the first half. And with a few minutes left, the Dallas Mavericks retake the lead in this one. And it's just some incredible shot making down the stretch. LA now is even this series up two games apiece. They do this, of course, without Kawhi Leonard. They won game one without Kawhi Leonard. They are 2 0 without Kawhi Leonard. They are 0 2 with him. I think we have to start with James Harden, Logan, because uh, the man was incredible in this one. I owe James Harden an apology for underestimating him. You owe him a handwritten letter. You might owe him a poem and a song because I underestimated him. You slandered him. You disrespected him. I think you might have met the legal standard for slander, not just what these kids throw out on the internet these days. No, like legitimately libelous claims you were saying about James Harden. And uh, he's just balling the hell out, man. How's he doing it? Thankfully, the Mavericks announcer went a little harder on him, you know, when the trade went down. So he's like my little shield. I don't I can remember put him out. saying the word washed. <laughs> that was uh, that was my quote. Maybe we'll do a nerd sesh quote graphic. Uh, James Harden is washed. And, you know, we'll just like slap my face on there. Uh, we'll attach the date of the pod. Yes. That was one of my core that. takes heading into the playoffs, man. Uh Harden balled out. Uh, I, I'm super impressed. And this is a big reason of why the Clippers got Harden. Uh, one, when you have a chance to add star power at the kind of value that you can get Harden at, you do it. But two, Kawhi Leonard's always been a big question when it comes to the playoffs. You know, ever since his run with the Raptors, like, he can do this. And we saw it briefly in Philly last year, you know, when he had his explosions. But it is a different role here. And – he doesn't normally have to go up against the other team's opposing best perimeter defenders, but that was so remarkable about this one is, you know, late in this game, he's blowing by PJ Washington on ball, man. He's getting into the teeth of the defense. Uh, more importantly, he was abusing. He was abusing Luca in yeah. like, I was so disappointed with Luca's defensive effort in this one, man, 33 points, uh, six board, seven assists on 12 of 17 shooting goes four or five from behind the arc. He has 15 points in the fourth quarter on six of eight shooting. Remarkable. Something that I didn't expect from James Harden at all in these. But the the thing that got me about that stretch was the fact that Dallas had Maxi Kleba in at the five spot when Harden kept attacking these paints. It was like, okay, well, yeah, Harden's blown by Luka. He's blown by PJ. You don't have anybody who can actually deter Harden from getting into that look. Like, it was just effortless for him. Uh, one, I think Harden just consistently needs to do this more get downhill. That's when he's at his best. Like Harden is dangerous when he can do this. And it opens up a new dimension for him playmaking wise. And when his touch shot is on, it's just an easy look for him. But I mean, Kleba is not remotely getting close to these shots. He's not even contesting them. He's dropping and trying to box out Mason Plumley. I thought that was a foolish decision by Dallas to not have either of those guys out there in crunch time, um, just as deterrence around the rim and just as, you know, guys who can grab a board. Not only do I want to, I want to give credit to Harden, Oh, my God. I mean, Paul George with just such a beautiful game. I think he had 16 first quarter points. He ends up with 33 in this one, six boards, eight assists. When you don't have your best player, your third star, you got to have your front men pull your weight like this, and they did. He bangs 7 of 10 from behind the arc. He bangs 11 of 19 from the field, and uh, the Stars balled out. You know, they shoot better, but it was those two guys. It was the perimeter shooting. And I thought it was this collective defense on Luka Doncic, man. I was super impressed with uh, how they defended Luka, man. If it was Terrence Mann, if it was Paul George, if it was Westbrook, whoever they put on him, I thought the ball pressure and the physicality that they played with all game long on Luka was really, really impressive. But, you know, James, I apologize to you after the first game. I'll do it again. I was just wrong, man. I was just a little quick, you know. Uh, the numbers didn't lie to me. You know, Harden was really bad during that last stretch. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was really bad, man. Uh, he was. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry. I uh, Maybe I should stop doubting you. Uh, maybe I should get you a basket full of muffins and flowers, and uh, maybe I should write that apology. I was wrong on James Harden, um, but I also thought that Dallas did a really poor job in terms of defensive personnel and engagement. He cooked PJ. He cooked Luka. They had Kleba out there at the five spot. I thought that was dumb, but... My bad, man. James, you balled out, man. I tip my cap to you. I'm not going to take it off because I'm bald and I'm a little embarrassed, but you balled out. <laughs> it's tough. They did not have answers down the stretch in this one. And I don't disagree that having 
a legitimate five out on the floor with the sort of size and length to potentially challenge some of those floaters would have been a positive change. But ultimately, James Harden just got what he wanted in this game. And Logan, he's been the best player in this series, which I could not have anticipated. With the Harden that we saw down the stretch, just with the names on the floor, obviously Kawhi has been taken out of that equation, but he has pretty clearly outplayed Luka, was way better in game one, was way better in this game, I would say was better in game three. He's averaging 26 points and seven assists per game on 73% true shooting. He is just in absolute control, and his shot making is absurd early in this game. Abusing switches with step backs. If he got a big on him, if he had Luka on him, and at the end of this game, he was hunting Luka again, so they were doing whatever they could to keep Luka from just getting toasted because this was such a bad defensive game from Luka, dude. It's been a roller coaster of a series from him on that end. I don't think the highs have been as high as some excited Mavs fans would have said, but like game two, he was really, really solid. Game three, he was fine. Game one, he was awful. This game, he was so bad. He picked up two fouls early and then he literally started playing like the hands behind your back defense. And it's like, Luka, Luka, don't do that. You're just inviting whoever it is to beat you off the bounce. Amir Coffey easily beat him off the bounce when he was doing that. So I thought they actually did a nice job of adjusting to make sure Harden couldn't get that Luka mismatch. They started pre-switching, which means whenever they see that Luka's man is about to set a screen for Harden to switch, they have Luka switch with another guy playing away from the ball. So now he is the one guarding the screener. They were trapping the switch where you would have PJ Washington come up. Right, So there's two defenders on Harden, but then Luka recovers to whoever PJ's man was. So now they have PJ on him. They uh, simply were not allowing the switch to happen. Like PJ was fighting over a screen in one spot, wouldn't let that switch happen. So they were keeping Luka off of Harden late, but it just didn't matter. He got a step on PJ Washington at will. And the mid-range and floater game, particularly in this one, has just been phenomenal. And the problem is... When James Harden is raining step back threes on you in single coverage, you have to play him so far out and you have to play him so tight. Like these guards, these guys are guarding up on him 30 feet out. They just don't have the foot speed to stick with him with all of that runway. He's too shifty. And when it's Luca or it's Maxi Kleba or it's PJ, who by the way, I do think is defended really well in Dallas, but he's not quick enough for that specific matchup. They're just getting cooked. And I know a lot of people are like, Jason Kidd, why would you keep conceding floaters? Well, the problem is you could say, yeah, I guess we'll quote unquote concede step back threes. We'll play a little bit further off. We'll let him get to those looks. He was raining those over you, right? He goes four or five from three in this game. And uh, you could double, but doubling outright against an ISO, like that is a very clear four on three. And there's a lot of shooting on the floor. Like there just wasn't a good answer. When Harden is this level of shot maker, when he is making every step back three and every floater, he's just a maestro, man, because the playmaking has been really, really good as well. This series, he's 7 of 11 on floaters. He is 5 of 5 on step back twos. He is 7 of 13 on step back threes. Like, there's nothing you can do with that. This was a bad matchup, and he abused that, but there's nothing you can do with that level of shot making. And it's been so, so impressive how he has dominated this series without finishing around the rim, because we saw last year that he was not going to be the same there, really struggled in the playoffs and throughout this regular season. Like he just doesn't get to the rim and finish around the rim at nearly the same volume that he did even a, a few years ago. But the true three level scoring from him, like this is the purest hoops James Harden has ever played. There's really very little foul grifting out there. Like, yeah, there's a couple spots where he exaggerates contact on a jumper and you'll see an occasional rip through or whatever. But like, this is just crazy shot making in brilliant, brilliant uh, offense. This is just an offensive genius. One of the best offensive players that we've seen in the history of this game playing unbelievable basketball when he wasn't doing it down the stretch. And he has been the best player on the floor, which has made all the difference in this series. They don't win game one without Harden dominating. They don't win this game without Harden dominating. And PJ also balled out. And what I loved about PG, that is, not PJ. PJ got cooked. But I just love the off-ball stuff from PG in this game. It makes him so special, being one of the best off-ball stars in the league. First two buckets of this game, they get for him coming off of screens. And uh, consistently throughout that first half, his relocations, his movement shooting, 
they were phenomenal and he just couldn't miss. And he was hitting tough pull-up threes too. Like he cooled down in the second half and they started trapping him some, forcing the ball out of his hands. But then he still hits that huge go-ahead three over Derek Jones Jr. Like this was the PG I wanted to see and I mostly expected because he was playing incredibly down the stretch of the regular season. He was playing so, so well and carrying them to a seven and three record without Kawhi. And this was like as efficient a PG as we've ever seen. He was so damn good this year. And that's why game three was so disappointing. It was just a lot of tough shots and he was missing them, but he made a lot of tough shots in this game and he got some good open looks from three. So those two were great. And defensively, I didn't think Dallas put their best foot forward. I thought there was some overhelping at times, leaving Terrence Mann wide open for a lot of threes. But a lot of this was just PG and Harden making crazy skilled shots that are the reasons that they're the great offensive players that they are. And Norman Powell comes in, knocks down some big shots. He's been pretty dynamic this series. He's just a dynamic offensive player off the bench. And the Clippers were 18 of 29 from deep. A lot of those being these pull-up looks. So you can't say it was like disastrous from Dallas defensively. It was a lot of really, really good offense winning out. Yeah, and the only reason the Mavericks stay in this game, you mentioned they trailed by 31 points in the first half, was because of Kyrie. I mean, Kyrie yeah, doesn't score a point in the first quarter. He scores 40 points in three quarters, 40 points, seven boards, five assists on 14 to 25 shooting, six to 12 from deep. Keeps him in this game. And outside of the entirety of the Sixers Knicks series, watching Paul George and Kyrie Irving trade buckets with each other in the fourth was like my favorite moment of the playoffs, maybe so far, man. That was, that was awesome. But I think we have to address the elephant in the room, and the elephant in the room is uh, the guy that's supposed to be the best player in this series. That's Luka Doncic. I have been thoroughly disappointed with Luka in this series. It is staggering to me uh, how bad Luka has been by his standards. Again, if you look at the counting numbers, not that bad. Uh, he goes for 29, 10, and 10 in this one. But it's 10 and 24 from the field. It's one of nine from behind the arc, and there's three turnovers. And something that you mentioned last game, Carson, um, about Luca was how much he was settling for his jump shot. I thought he settled a ton in this one. Um, he's just not getting downhill. I thought he telegraphed a lot of his passes. I mean, just led to easy, easy turnovers for the Clippers. There's this one bad one on Westbrook where Westbrook just rotates over to the corner. Bang. Um, they, he got picked apart defensively. The Clippers were hunting him during a stretch in this game. James Harden was just blowing by him in single coverage. On the series, he's 29-10-9. On 39% from the field, 27% from deep, 51% true shooting with four turnovers a game. I mean, it has been atrociously bad for Luka. If Luka's not going to be the best player in this series, the Mavericks aren't going to win, point blank, period. And so I think he's got to get downhill more. It's just when the offense is at its best, you're asking Kyrie to pull an absurd weight right now. Like, yeah. expecting him to do this every single game is just – Unreal. The Mavericks shouldn't have been in this game with the level that Luka Doncic was playing at. And Kyrie willed them back into this one. Like, God, he's just also got such a smooth game. That's what I mean with that Kyrie PG battle, dude. It is like two of the smoothest hoopers ever just going it's at sexual. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, it's erotic. It is erotic basketball. Um, it is. He's got to be engaged more defensively, just lackluster engagement and effort in game two. And maybe he is dealing with a little knee injury. And like Chat mentioned in two, he said it. After the game, Luka came out and said, I feel like I'm letting him down. That is a direct quote of Luka about Kyrie. I'm glad he recognizes it. It is about him consciously changing the way he is playing the game. It's not really about, mm -hmm. oh, I need more shots to fall. No, I need more effort defensively. I need more effort on the glass. I need you getting downhill more and doing more, man. I have been really, really disappointed. Uh, with Luca's play. And like I said, I give a massive amount of credit to the Clippers defense, Terrence Mann, Russell Westbrook, Paul George, all the guys that play on him. Um, great ball pressure, great activity, great physicality, but Luca should kill all those guys. You know, Luca is one of the best offensive players on planet earth. He should be torching everybody. And he's not, he is not playing anywhere close to his level of play. He is not playing as the best player in this series, and they are not going to win if he is not the best player in this series. It's been really disappointing from Luca, and generally the results of basically every matchup, every action is him settling for a tough jumper. Even though he isn't driving nearly at the volume that he should be, the results when he gets into the paint are still really good. Like there's several instances in this game where he gets a switch, and he drives. He gets a step on the slow-footed big, draws a foul versus Plumley. He passes and cuts off a switch, and he gets a layup. 
if it's a smaller defender on him, he bullies Amir Coffey. He gets to the line. Like we know that he's capable of it, but he is so reliant on those tough looks. You mentioned the efficiency has been brutal. He's only 26% from deep in this series. He's attempted seven shots in the restricted area. As I mentioned last show over his previous two playoff series against LA, he was taking over five restricted area shots per game. Like that's just when he's going to be at his best and when he's going to threaten the defense the most. And it's the biggest problem when he's missing those jumpers because he's a really good jump shooter. He can make these tough shots, but he is consistently clanking jumpers and not adjusting his play style nearly enough to account for that. And this was another really bad defensive game. So when he is just missing tough jumper after tough jumper, then it's like, especially if he's going to be a clear negative defender like he was in this game, Luca's not doing a lot to really positively contribute. He's slowing the pace. He doesn't really allow other guys to get into rhythm. And I'm not saying that there's a bunch of other dudes who I want handling the ball other than Luka Doncic, but it just becomes stagnant. And it's a lot of tough shot making that isn't working. And uh, that's a downside from him that you don't normally see over four games like this, where he is consistently struggling to look like the player that we know he should be offensively. And, uh, it would be easy to say it's the tweaked knee that we saw in game three. I'm not discounting that, but like he was bad in game one. This tendency has been the case throughout the entire series. And it is rough when Kyrie gives you a game like he did tonight, where it's not just 40. It's a ridiculous 40. And he single-handedly brought them back into this game. 12 straight points over four possessions. He has a three-point play and then three straight threes in the second quarter when they had gone down 31. Like he breathed life into them. That game was over. And then it wasn't because of Kyrie Irving. And in the fourth quarter, like he is hitting these late shot clock bailouts where Luca's running in action and it stagnates. And then it's like, all right, Kyrie, what can you do? And he makes these incredible shots. He's finishing on a runner, like a really tough layup down the stretch. He was so great. And in this series, he's giving you 29 points per game on 65% true shooting. He has been streaky. He has had several slow starts, but he's had these unreal hot streaks. Like every game, there has been a stretch where Kyrie is just unstoppable. And that bottom line production and efficiency is the Kyrie that you need. And Luka is just not good enough right now. And that is going to determine the ceiling of this team. Because I have been optimistic about them defending at a higher level, being more athletic and bigger in the front court. And then you have these two dudes, man, and nobody is going to be able to guard these two dudes. But you need Luka to be the top three player, to be the top two offensive player that we believe him to be, and he just hasn't been close to that. And that's so, so harmful to what this Dallas team can do. And then also, I've just been underwhelmed with uh, the Mavs as a whole, and particularly the fact that you could have two awful starts like to this extent within one series where you're down 30 in the first half to a team that is down their quote unquote best player. Obviously Kawhi isn't that version of himself right now when he's super bothered by the knee, but regardless of opponent shot, like the clips have shot the lights out in games one and four. I get that, but it's your offense. You're sitting with 20 something points deep into the second quarter of two different playoff games. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. I'm very worried about this version of Luka. And if Luka isn't great, like you just don't have enough skilled shot making alongside them. Props to Derek Jones Jr. He knocked down his jumpers. He attacked closeouts. But again, it's like him and PJ, they're not going to be consistent enough there. You don't have real weapons other than Luka and Kyrie. It is those dudes going crazy and everybody else doing their job that makes you a threat. It's discouraging what we're seeing from Dallas right now. Luka needs to turn it around, and he needs to turn it around fast because even if they survive this series without Kawhi, which is not a guarantee, and by the way, if Kawhi was himself, they'd certainly be down 3-1 right now. Like, LA would just clearly be better. This version of Dallas, probably not beating OKC, right? They're just not the threat that we believed they could be and the great team that they were down the stretch of the regular season. That can all change with Luca flipping the switch, but he's got to flip the switch. I don't have a ton to add. Uh, I will mention the shooting uh, eight of 12 versus O of eight to open this game. That's what created the big discrepancy. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Clippers lead 36 to 16 after the first quarter at the end of the first half, the Clippers had made 14 of 21 threes. The Mavs had made four of 15. So yeah, I mean, when your team is shooting like that, you just need more from your star, and you cannot settle. 
and the last adjustment, like I mentioned earlier, that I think Dallas has to make, more Gafford and Lively. We get 18 minutes of both of those guys. Uh, we get 21 minutes of Maxi Kleba, and I just think that, you know, I like Kleba. Maybe give him some four minutes if you really want that shooting and size out there, but uh, I just think the Mavs are so, uh, so much better as a team with Gafford and Lively in at the five spot, and that was the point of making the trade, right? So you could have 48 minutes of both of these guys. So you could play them both 24 and 24, whatever the split is. I get that Kleba gives them a little bit of a different look, but Mason Plumley was crushing him in the fourth quarter. That was embarrassing. You were letting Mason Plumley Plum cook dog. you in the fourth quarter of a playoff game. I mean, he's jumping over him. He's getting rebounds. He's getting buckets. Like, bro, Mason Plumley cannot be crushing you in the fourth quarter of a playoff game, man. It's embarrassing. I want more Gafford. I want Lively. Most importantly, as we have discussed, Luka's got to be the best version of himself or the Mavs don't have a prayer of winning this series or doing anything meaningful in these playoffs. Kleba's been good in this series. I don't want to push back on Kleba minutes. What I will say is when James Harden is getting to his floater effortlessly and you don't have somebody with the size to uh, be able to challenge them and potentially also play the dump off passes to Vita Zubots, right? Just to have that sort of size on the interior, then you can bring him out. And I don't know if they were worried about him exposing uh, the bigs in space, but uh, there are ways around that. So I understand it for the close. I do think Kleba's mostly been good, very versatile defensively. Had a nice pass in this game off of uh, a Luca trap, I believe. Knocked down his one spot up jumper. But I'm not married to Kleba minutes. But I think overall in this series, they have mostly been a positive. But yeah, dude, Luca needs to uh, dial in because this is an unacceptable level. Like, uh, he's lucky that Kawhi wasn't himself, dude, and that they are at 2-2 in this series because we've never seen playoff Luca struggle like this. Like, this is a man who has consistently risen to the occasion and dominated. And right now, not the case at all. 